Hey friends, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security nerd, Corey Knockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting July 28, 2014. Let's start with news of another big Android vulnerability. A while back, a company called Blue Box Labs discovered a vulnerability in various Android systems, even old Android systems back in January 2010, all the way up to the most recent or almost the most recent Android systems, which they're calling the fake ID vulnerability. Essentially, this is a vulnerability in how Android systems process digital certificates. Whenever you install new apps on your Google or Android phone, it uses certificates to check the validity of that particular application. However, they also allow the normal certificate chain of trust, meaning applications can also use child certificates that are attached to parent certificates. Long story short, Blue Box Labs found that Android devices do not fully validate the certificate chain. This means that malicious applications can actually use certificates from other valid applications. And by doing so, they can actually gain some of the access or privilege of those valid applications. For instance, Google Wallet uses the NFC chip in your phone. A malicious app can use Google Wallet's certificate to also use the NFC chip. Or if a particular application gives you management access to the phone, a malicious application can also break the sandbox and get that management application. Application. Now the good news is Blue Box told Google about this vulnerability long ago and back in April Google released KitKat which fixes this particular flaw. However the bad news is research shows that 80% of Android devices are not running KitKat or the latest OS. The problem is all the carriers out there that custom roll Android have not upgraded to the latest KitKat yet meaning many many users are still running older vulnerable versions. So what can you do about this? Well, besides trying to upgrade to KitKat if your carrier supports it, the other thing to do is make sure to pay attention to where you get Android applications. You should only get them from sanctioned marketplaces like Google Play. Google will do a pretty good job of making sure that no malware goes onto their marketplace, although it has come up there in the past. So really be careful where you get applications. Do not get them from unsanctioned third-party sites. And by the way, if there's a free uh, version of application you know normally costs money, it's it's probably a bad sign. Now the researchers who found this flaw will be talking more about it at Black Hat, which I'm attending next week, so I may bring you updates on this uh, vulnerability in the future. The next big security story this week is the Department of Homeland Security and U.S. CERT warning about the Back Off Attack Campaign. This is an attack campaign that seems to target researchers with point-of-sale systems. According to an alert that uh, U.S. CERT released, and which I'll put a link to in the blog post associated with this video, some unknown attackers have been scanning systems looking for remote desktop applications, like the ones made by Microsoft, Apple, LogMeIn, and many, many others. If they can find access to a remote desktop application, they'll then try to brute force it for administrative passwords. And if they can find such a password, they will then log into that system and start to try to spread their point of sale malware. Now the point of sale malware looks a lot like other malware that's out there. It has a command and control channel that leverages HTTP. It tries to infect point of sale systems and install a RAM scraper so it can steal track data and then report that back to attackers. Now the one main difference is these attackers are very good at changing the variants of their point of sale malware and making zero day variants that when they were first launched no antivirus, no traditional antivirus system was able to catch them. According to this alert they've actually attacked over 600 different US businesses with this attack so it's a pretty big deal. Now what can you do about this? Well there's a number of things. First as far as remote desktop applications you need to limit access to them. 
Even if you have some sort of business needs for administrators to access remote desktop applications, you should use your access control device or your next generation firewall or unified threat management device to pick who can access that particular remote desktop application. There's ways to do this with VPN, limiting it by IP address, limiting it by a username where someone has to pre-authenticate. Many different ways where you can make sure that not everyone on the internet can access your Microsoft remote desktop. So that's one thing to do. Obviously, another thing to do is make a very, very strong administrative password, a different password than you use anywhere else. This way is going to make it difficult for attackers to brute force it. Finally, as far as the malware itself, according to this alert, AV companies were not able to detect this malware on day one. Now, since then, the particular alert shares hash values for many of these different malware variants, and several AV companies, including WatchGuard's companies like Kaspersky and AVG, can and catch it. But this is specifically why you need some sort of modern advanced threat detection solution like WatchGuard's APT blocker. These sorts of solutions will take zero-day malware and run them in a sandbox. And by paying attention to the various behaviors they do, we're often able to catch this zero-day malware even if we've never seen it before, even when signature-based solutions fail. So again, use strong passwords, limit access to remote desktop applications, and be sure to start considering advanced threat protection solutions like WatchGuard's APT blocker. So for the final and biggest story this week, I'd like to talk about bad USB. During the week, a pair of researchers from SR Labs in Germany released information or a little bit of information about a very big industry-wide USB vulnerability that they're going to disclose more detail about at Black Hat next week. Now, essentially, we've known as security experts that there's been many issues with USB. You know, someone can uh, use autoplay on USB to forcefully install malware if you turn on autoplay on a Windows system. Back when Stuxnet was released, Stuxnet took advantage of a flaw in the way Windows used shortcut files so that if you loaded a USB storage device, it would automatically exploit malware. So we've known for a number of reasons that USB keys could be dangerous. But this particular research is a little different. Uh, what these researchers have talked about is how every single USB device, whether it's a keyboard, a storage device, a mouse, whatever USB device you have, all of these USB devices have a USB controller. And this is a special circuit in firmware that's designed to talk to the computer and share a little bit of information so they can sync up and decide what kind of USB device this particular thing is. Now, these particular SR Labs researchers have found a way to actually infect the firmware of these USB controllers and then use them to actually lie to the computer. So you can put a USB key in that says it's a keyboard and then you can key log and many other different things like that. So again, there's not a lot of technical detail about this, but these researchers are going to be speaking at Black Hat next week, which I'm attending. So I'll be sure to share all the detail, including the proof of concept code that they plan to release to talk about this vulnerability. So if this is true, what can you do about it? If it's true, it means that any USB device can be considered malicious. You can't really know if a USB device you plug into your computer is dangerous. Antivirus programs, for instance, can't check the firmware of USB devices and there's no easy way to publish signatures for all these firmwares to make sure that yours is valid. In fact, as I think about it, even manufacturers were always worried about a manufacturer in another country actually infecting their devices on purpose and sending them to nation states. How are we to know that they're not doing this with USB devices they're sending to us now? And there's no easy answer for these questions yet. But before we actually overreact, do you know that each USB controller firmware is slightly different and proprietary. Chances are the researchers that did this did it only with one particular type of a device. But according to them, it is a flaw in the USB standard itself. So this should be a very interesting talk. For now, just know that every time you take an untrusted USB device and plug it into your computer, you may be taking a risk. At the very least, you might want to only trust USB devices that you've uh, bought and unwrapped yourself. So that's it for this week. I hope you found it interesting and maybe educational. And you may have noticed a number of the stories this week covered vulnerabilities which will be discussed in more depth next week at the Black Hat Security Conference and probably at its sister conference, DEF CON, of which I'm attending.
So that brings me to a show note. Since I'm attending Black Hat next week, the show will be a little different. First of all, rather than just bringing you to security news, I'll probably recap some of my favorite briefings that I see at Black Hat. On top of that, since I'll be attending these shows and will probably be quite busy, I may not be able to post the video at the regular time. I may post a video earlier or maybe shorter ones throughout the week, or maybe I'll just wait till the weekend to release the weekly video. In any case, know it's going to come at a slightly different time next week. Finally, there's there's a number of other security stories this week, like a story about Chinese attackers allegedly going after Israel's Iron Dome missile system or missile defense system, and a number of other stories besides that. So as always, be sure to check out the WatchGuard Security Center blog. Besides posting occasional articles, I'll also have a reference section in the blog post associated with this video, which has a number of other interesting security stories you might want to read up on. As always, if you want more security news, be sure to follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.